Hello, Wei. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, for this um, workshop in the Canadian Outdoor Learning uh, Winter Workshop Series. Uh, my name is Jade Harvey Beryl, and I'm part of the team uh, at the Outdoor Learning Store, and we are a charitable social enterprise offering outdoor learning equipment and resources uh, for educators and learners, and then supporting outdoor learning nonprofit organizations with or any profits that we make. I also work closely with Take Me Outside, who are our partner in delivering this workshop. I'm joining you today from Revelstoke, which is the traditional and unceded territories of the Sinaiq's people. I must recognize also that our organization spans and operates across the Columbia River Basin, which has been utilized by the Tanaha, Chichwemek, and Okanagan Silks people. We know that in the context of outdoor learning, uh, where we are, it is fundamental to develop our understanding of local traditional ecological knowledge and perspectives, and take time to nurture relationships with the indigenous people who've called this place home for millennia. And so if you're joining us from a place um, that is relevant, we encourage you um, to consider firstly what you can do to deepen your understanding and invite you to share in the chat what Indigenous territory you're joining us from today. <clears throat> and while you all do that, I'll take a second to introduce myself. My name is Farheen and I work with the Take Me Outside team. Um, on behalf of our organization and our 27 outdoor learning partners, I'd like to welcome all of you to this workshop this evening. I'm joining you from Toronto, um, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Anishinaabe people. And I'm grateful to be able to share this land and um, yeah, gain this knowledge today. Excited, and I'll pass it back over to Jade. Thank you, Fahim. So with the ongoing global complexities that are facing us all, um, we're excited to be able to offer these workshops virtually, uh, enabling more people across Turtle Island and our Earth to join us, um, and especially those who are more remote or underrepresented. Um, the passion in the field of outdoor learning um, makes me feel more connected uh, every time we do one of these and we see, you know, 70 people joining together. Um, I think that's incredibly uh, powerful. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for this moment too. Uh, for those of you just joining us, welcome to Zoom. Um, you can hover top right, you'll see a view button come up if you want to put speaker view for when our presenters begin, or you can do gallery view and see everybody's faces. Uh, please stay on mute, uh, but please leave your video on if you so wish, then, um, our lovely presenters have uh, faces to look at. Um, today's outline, we are going to begin with a short tobacco um, ceremony. Then we'll have the presentation, some Q&A, and there will be prizes at the end, so stay around to the end. Um, we will be recording this session with permission, and uh, that will be sent out in a follow-up email tomorrow. And um, so thank you for sharing uh, your Indigenous acknowledgement. I wonder, though, who are you? So if you could type in the chat, are you a K to kindergarten teacher, grade one? Are you a community educator? Are you uh, a homeschool parent or guardian? Um, I'd love to get an understanding of, of who's joining us today um, and, and what your, your passion or your work is, if you can take a moment. So just as we get going, this virtual workshop series is brought to you by a group uh, of over 25 partners and advisors from across Canada. Uh, they offer their own outdoor and environmental education resources, programs and support. And I'm just gonna share quickly uh, a little bit of their names as we go through. Oh, thanks, we've got some people joining us. Oh, we've got some from the USA in Singapore, homeschool community, teaching schools, it looks like we've got a phenomenal range. Okay, so welcome to Not Extinct, Keeping the Sinaiq's Way. Our partners in this are Take Me Outside, Paxfun, Ecom, Green Teacher, Green Learning, Natural Curiosity, Water Rangers, Sea Bean, Ipsa, Wild Sight, Geoc, Sask Outdoors, Ace, Stoked on Science, Get Outside and Play, OC, Classrooms to Communities, KB, Learning for a Sustainable Future, Eco Schools Canada, Imagined, 
Leave No Trace Canada, Nature for All, Megan Zenny, the New Brunswick Environmental Network, CPAWS, Outdoor Council of Canada, Oceanwise, Project Wet, Interpretation Canada, Interpretive Guides Association, and finally Nature Kids BC and Project Learning Tree Canada. So um, just to introduce you to our two fantastic hosts today. Uh, Marilyn James was appointed by her elders as Smum M, Smum Im matriarch responsible for upholding Sinaiq's protocols and laws in the Sinaiq's, my, I've lost my ability to pronounce it, just one moment. <laughs> Excuse me. Wuplakin and Smum Im laws. She is a knowledge keeper. She is a knowledge keeper for her people and accomplished storyteller of traditional and contemporary Sinaiq stories. She is the co-author of Not Extinct: Keeping the Sinaiq's Way, which uh, there was a first edition in 2018, and the second edition has been released and is what we're focusing on today. She also holds a Master's of Education from Simon Fraser University, and is an ardent advocate for land and water. Also joining us is Therese Alexis. She's a Sinaiq's mother of two young children who's worked as an Aboriginal education support worker and teaching consultant in three BC school districts where she delivered culturally appropriate materials to school aged children using storytelling and crafts. She's also been an active storyteller at the Kootenai Storytelling Festival since 2006 and works with community members in other contexts to enhance cultural sensitivity towards the First Nations community. She's currently working on expanding her repertoire of original and traditional Sinaiq stories for children and general audiences, as well as writing children's books. She currently works for School District 51 in the Grand Forks area. She's the recipient of a previous CCA grant through the Aboriginal Storytelling Programme to record Sinaiq stories. And these became the backbone of Not Extinct, Keeping the Sinaiq's Way, uh, the book and audio art project that she co-authored with Marilyn and that we are going to, I think, delve into a little bit more today. So before I hand it over, I would, uh, Marilyn and Teresa, I would invite you to stand with me. Here I have two pouches of traditional tobacco. And we offer the ancestors this tobacco and ask that they bless this educational workshop and that it might help people learn more about the Sinaiq's and that we come into this right relationship with the people of this land. Now attendees, if you are sitting, I would encourage you to stand up and I'll ask you to put your palms facing forward at your side. Uh, and you will turn through the four points of the compass. North, east, south, west. Um, Marilyn will now say thank you four times and we can join in if uh, you feel comfortable. And to our sacred mountain swore war, how can we say, limb, 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 So I put some tobacco down here. I'll make sure and put it outside when we're, when we're done. And I will send these pouches to you in the post uh, as our offering to be with you in person. And so it's time for me to turn off my voice and open the floor for Marilyn and Therese uh, to share your beautiful stories. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'd like to start uh, with a little bit of background. The Sinai's people uh, are governmentally declared extinct and have been since 1956, even though we're here. Um, we have been fighting this declared extinction order since that time and um, have been trying to uphold our traditional laws in our Tumhulao, our territory, 
And those two laws are, the big law is Waplaken, which basically means that we're responsible for everything, everything that's here, every living, animate, inanimate, thing that's here on this land. We hold responsibility for its sustainability. And we also hold a responsibility to um, keep everything here that, that's here when we started. The second law is mamim, which literally translates into belongs to the women. So this law is, is what I represent in terms of this tumhulau, and it means that the women, in good times, of course, and prosperous times, it's a really great thing. But not only do we own all the good things, we also own orphans, we own grief, we own hunger, we own death, we own all those other things with on this land that we deal with. So, it's not, uh, it's not designed to um, make us princesses or goddesses. It's to hand the work to us. So I'd like to um, tell a story, the book that you might have seen, and it's probably on the website, is this book. The biggest part of this book represents chaptickles, which are our creation stories. And in this book, and in the first one, we took a few more contemporary stories as opposed to the creation stories and began telling those. And caribou is kind of a hot button issue in our Tumula right now. They're talking about um, maternity pens for female caribou up in the Revelstoke area and um, I'm certainly opposed to that. We used to have six caribou here um, that were translocated here. The issues around sustainability for caribou, of course, is protection of old growth because that is their key habitat. But uh, they translocated those caribou up around Revelstoke. There were seven, I believe, they translocated six and they couldn't catch one male. So we have one lonely male wandering around in the southern part of our Tumulau. They translocated the rest of them up north. And now they're talking about translocating more caribou to that region. It's a, certainly is a challenge because there isn't the wherewithal in the Ministry of Forests and, and people who manage the landscape to protect the critical habitat for the caribou and to do the right things. I have an extensive paper on my arguments against net gunning and the way they capture and release caribou. But this is a story I learned a while back. It was told by my matriarch, Eva Orr, it was told by her son, Bob Campbell. And it was Eva Orr's brother who talked about it. And back in the day when we were sent to the res, it wasn't a very good time. A lot of hunger. Uh, at that point, there was no welfare. There were no food banks. When people were hungry, they were left to be hungry. And Indian people on the reservation didn't have a lot of opportunities to have jobs and be gainfully employed and to feed their families. So it was quite a struggle. This particular family, the Adolf family, which I'm also related to, um, they used to cross the border clandestinely from the US, which is where our Southern part of our territory is, about 20% in the US and about 80% in Canada. Our people were basically warned away from going for gold because the miners were present and it was a big threat to us to be caught by miners because they would kill us. 
and uh, pursue us. But when things got so bad on the res and people were hungry, a contingent of uh, Ambrose Adolph, he was just a young fellow at the time in his early teens. He was the driver of the Model A that they drove from Omak, Washington on up to Revelstoke. There is where they were planning to take enough gold to see them through the year. They went and uh, Ambrose was the young fellow of the time. He would not only was the driver, he was designated as the hunter and to uh, keep the camp while the old fellas did what they needed to do. Ambrose said, oh, the travel was horrid. You can imagine back in the day, no pavement going on, muddy uh, dirt track to get all the way from Omak to Revelstoke. It took days, days and days. They made it up there and they began setting up their camp. They had to, uh, you know, make camp. And they told Ambrose, you go on off and see if you can get us something for dinner. So Ambrose said they were camped by this cottonwood grove that he said was miles long. It was just an amazing cottonwood grove. We don't see cottonwood groves like that, but he said it was miles long. So he had his rifle across his arm and he walked into this cottonwood grove. He said it was magnificent. He said it was just like a, a park under these huge cottonwood trees. And he had his gun at the ready and a grouse flew up. When the grouse flew up, he lifted his rifle up and what he saw so amazed him that he forgot all about the grouse because up in the crotches of the cottonwood trees were hundreds and thousands of antlers stacked in the branches. Some were just stacked like this to take them off the ground. Some were actually set up almost like hunting nests in the crotches of the trees. He was amazed. He said it was just amazing to see these antlers in the trees. He ran out and he found the old fellas and he says, come and see, come and see what I found. He says, I'm so um, amazed. And the old guys told him, oh, you found our ancestor's spot. Well, when the caribou would migrate through this area by the tens of thousands and were one of the main food sources for our people, that was when they would go down through the cottonwoods and migrate and our people would be up in the trees killing the caribou as they migrated through that area. Of course, if you've ever seen a caribou, they have big feet. They're not clumsy, but you wouldn't leave all those antlers season after season to uh, be left on the ground for tripping or puncturing or injuring those animals or their babies. So they took to piling the antlers up in the trees where they would be off the ground and that air would be clear. Ambrose, he said, he went to, he went to war. He didn't think he was gonna make it. He, he, he went in World War II, I think. And he said all the time he was in the war and he would think of home that would be the one place he would really think of that one spot. 
he told himself, if I ever, ever make it out of here, if I make it back home, if I live, he said, I'm going to go see that place. Well, Ambrose did make it home. He came back home and he told these people, I got to go see that place again. It's one of the things I really thought about and dreamt about. And I said, if I live, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go see that place again. Ambrose said he made his way back up to Revelstoke. And when he got there, there was no cottonwood grove. There were no trees left standing, only fences and fields. That was what was left of the caribou migration and how that was the beginning of the end for the caribou and how our people relied on them in our Tumhulau and through their migrations. And so that's one sorrow we carry with us is when these things leave our landscape and um, and they're no longer here. So that story in the book is called In the Shadow of Extinction. And of course, you know, none of these stories are in that book. When you get that book, you actually go and download the stories and you have to listen to them audio style. That is us upholding the oral tradition of our people. What's included in the story in the book is a synopsis of what the story is. And then we expounded upon the cultural perspectives of what that story meant to us. And then we also decided it would be very helpful if we engaged with settler folk and they listened to the story and then of course, there's a settler perspective. It is a license for settlers to understand. Perspectives of stories grow as you begin, as you listen to them, you formulate perspective. As you grow into those stories and you live with them for a period of time, your perspectives begin to change. But a lot of people don't engage culturally that way, but we have invited it so that people can begin this intercultural relationship through story. Um, again, we are concerned about where this new uh, tactic of bringing caribou in. We worry about the habitat that they have. When caribou are put in maternity pens, the females are kept there. They're not given proper food. Um, they're fed alfalfa. Uh, caribou cannot process alfalfa. They, they could eat a ton of it and get no nutritive value. They saw the horns off of these females before they give birth and they turn them loose out into the mountains. And so they have no way of defending their babies once they go onto the landscape. They're also translocating these caribou. And in that translocation, these female impreg pregnant females are being translocated to a completely different territory than they know. So not only are they released onto the landscape, not knowing, no horns for protecting their babies. There's just a lot of issues around that. But the main issue is their critical habitat is be being taken down, even though there was an announcement to protect old growth, um, old growth forests. Once the announcement was made, 
the tenure for logging companies in old growth tenure went up 80%. So instead of preserving it and protecting it and know that old growth is not only key habitat for caribou, it is a dyna dynamic um, contribution to um, biodiversity and the seven layers of understory to those massive cedars or hemlock or uh, spruce. We're trying to preserve all old growth in this Tumulo. So critical issues abound around caribou. And um, I hope you will engage in some of that education. If it's not listed on um, this link, it's you can go to our new website is synaix.org and it, um, it's got our land declaration and a lot of the issues and concerns that we are focused on today. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you, Marilyn. Over to Therese. Um, I thought I would talk to you all a, a little bit about cedar today and um, just the importance of uh, cedar itself in uh, the culture of many Indigenous people, but um, the Sinaiics, and sort of the relationship that it, we have with cedar. Um, Pre-contact pre or whatever you want to call it, I think everybody would have had the ability to um, utilize cedar uh, all, all throughout the, their village and community. And um, for me personally, uh, when I first was um, introduced to cedar and the ability to weave and utilize it, um, for me, it was a, uh, it opened so much more um, culturally for me. I was given a few pieces and I created a small basket and the amount of pride that I felt after accomplishing that for myself um, was big. It was a really big thing for me. Um, and it sort of like helped me to, uh, I guess, discover different avenues of weaving and how that would have been utilized within my culture. Um, Thule mats, for example, are another uh, big part of the Sinex culture and lodging. And um, that would be harvesting and then just twining of the materials. And so, um, yeah, I sort of, after I did my first little project there, then I went, I didn't even actually know how to harvest cedar. I didn't know anything about that and um, was given the opportunity to harvest. And it wasn't like a traditional, um, like uh, like culturally modifying a tree. It wasn't like that. It was this woman who w was getting rid of some cedar trees on her property and she was cutting them down and, um, and that's how I learned. And so that's sort of how I've been doing it now. And if, so somebody has a cedar they're taking down, then I'll say, oh, do you mind if I take the bark off? And then um, because the tree is dying anyways, I don't feel like because I don't know what I'm doing and how to culturally modify a tree, I wouldn't want to kill a, a living thing like that. Um, that is so old and, uh, and has so much medicine to offer. So yeah, that's sort of where where my sort of cedar, um, I guess my cedar journey started was just like with a few pieces and then it just opened up so much more for me. Uh, recently we were in a meeting and um, 
the Sinaiks, the autonomous Sinaiks are renaming, um, doing a lot of place naming in, in, their, in our traditional territory. And one of them was for the Cedar, Cedar Trail up by Rosland. And um, we had discovered that they, well, they were given the word mall reap, which isn't the word for cedar. Well, they thought it was, we thought it was the word for cedar, but mall reap is actually for birch. But the cedar word in Sinaiq or Sinsilixen is uh, mall, mall, mall reap, or in Salish, I mean, sorry. And so um, it was interesting after that, we sort of went down the rabbit hole of trees and what their prefixes are, and, um, not prefixes, but the, the ending sounds of, of them. And we discovered that the ones that were utilized in or had some special use all ended with the ILP. And so that, um, that little discovery for us personally wouldn't have been possible without the cedar and the birch being so closely related. Mom, do you remember what the other names were that were on that list? Ash? Um, alder, ash, um, and it's not birch, it's balsam fir. I mean balsam fir, yeah, balsam yeah. fir. And so balsam fir is Malreep and cedar is Malheep, 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 Malheep. Yeah. And, and balsam is Malreep. Malreep. And yeah, but a lot of our trees that we utilized in the work that we do, whether it's smoking or um, utilizing for other re work, all has that little prefix or post facts at the end of the words. Yeah, it was the eat, eat sound, yes. I guess. Yeah. Um, and for me personally, I haven't learned a story on cedar, uh, like a traditional um, story. Um, I haven't heard one yet, but I'm hoping that one day I will discover one, whether it's um, from another person telling me their relationship with the, their, with cedar <clears throat> and how it was sort of brought to them. Um, and the interesting thing about baskets too is that every basket, uh, for me personally, holds a story. It contains that moment in life, um, in my life. So um, I, I always think of that when I'm looking at other baskets and Oh, well, what was this person doing and what kind of like state were they in? Were they in a happy state or were they sort of like, oh, this is just another project. Um, we recently just put in some family baskets into the Rosa Museum. <clears throat> and one of the cedar root basket is over 500 years old. And it's still, it's such a beautiful piece of work and I just, every time I look at it, I'm so envious because the weave is so tight and um, it's like perfect. It's like it holds so much history and, and story within that one little basket that's been passed down through generations. And then the other piece is a woven corn husk bag with uh, natural dyes and the dyes for as old as it is, the colors are still so vibrant and amazing. And um, yeah, I'm just envious because no matter, you know, I don't think anybody today could produce dyes that could withstand that kind of the test of that kind of time. So um, to me, that's always amazing to, uh, to see that work and how the craftsmanship of so long ago um, has, has held up. Because when you look at my baskets, they're very, very crude and nowhere near what my ancestors um, <clears throat> produced at all. <laughs> so. And would you tell them a bit about like when you would harvest the inner bark of the cedar and also uh, the two different kinds of cedar bark and cedar root? <clears throat> right. So the you want to harvest 
cedar when the sap is running. You don't want to um, harvest too late in the summer because it's still, it'll get hard and it's stickier. Um, and then too early and it's still frozen, right? So you want it when it's nice, it's like the maple, I guess, when it's running, the sap is running. Um, so that would be just a, a later spring when everything's warm and it stays warm. Um, and that's for the, you wanna, you wanna take out the outer bark and then what you're after is the inner cambium, um, fleshy, the fleshy meat of the tree on the inside. And that can be quite thick. And so you have to split that down into um, layers. And a lot of people are very skilled and can use their hands just by like um, peeling them and separating them apart. And then from there, you can either use it right away or you can preserve it, dry it and preserve it. And I usually preserve it like by roll, like just rolling it into rolls and then hanging it to dry. Um, and this, then they, they do a similar process with the cedar root. Um, the cedar root's a lot harder to um, harvest actually than, well, it is for me. <laughs> I've, and I've only watched it uh, <laughs> and it looks difficult. I, so I just haven't tried, but there's also that chance of killing that tree as well when you're, when you're harvesting. So um, for me, I, I wouldn't want to uh, take that chance unless I completely understood the process and was completely confident in my skill. Um, and there are a lot of people who harvest that way and uh, and teach a lot of basket workshops to students out there. Um, and recently I just took, uh, with School District 51, I took a, um, we did a cedar weaving workshop with uh, Shy Waters, who is a very accomplished um, cedar weaver in, on the Sunshine Coast. And she is amazing. Um, she was able to, I had cedar weaving experience, so it was a little bit easier, but she was able to uh, teach a class completely over Zoom. She sends you the materials and then um, she just does a little Zoom meeting. Uh, so it was interesting to uh, participate in that way, but she was really good at it. And she actually uh, harvests by like modifying trees. So she will go out and with her partner and harvest um, in that way. And she also teaches that as well, um, which is really amazing. So, uh, yeah. And what else did you say, mom? Was that it? What else did you want me to say or cover? Uh, about cedar root, because there's yeah, two cedar different. Root is the same thing, but they like, um, and cedar root was, my understanding was used in a lot of the detail work. Um, and it was much, uh, you could produce much finer work actually with the cedar root than with the inner bark itself. Um, that basket that is in the Ross Museum is mostly uh, cedar root and it is very, very fine. And um, at one point looked like it was probably even watertight. So, uh, and that's the other th cool thing about cedar is that some of, you know, they, could make these baskets watertight. Um, and so they could carry water. They could, um, they even had cooking baskets. So they would utilize the baskets to cook food. Um, so it was amazing because their technology for baskets were so advanced um, for that time. And the yeah, just that their ability, everybody in the village would have had that ability to um, to weave or to produce a vessel that would help them carry food, to carry water. Um, the men would have used twining to um, and rope making to produce um, their, some of their weapons for hunting and um, travel. And then there would have been children who would have been apprenticing to become these 
master basket makers at that time as well. Um, but then there was, oh my, sorry, my dog just came in and looked at me and then I got distracted. Uh, there was something <laughs> where I was going with this. Oh, and then, yeah, so the harvesting part of that, it would have been more of a, back then, more of a community-oriented type um, of, an, of an event, right? Like that time of harvest would have been very important and a lot of people would have taken part in that. Um, and sort of when, we, when we've harvested in the past as well, like my mom and I have tried to do that with our community. We'll ask a few community members to come and join us and their children and then my children and then we all take part and learn and participate together so that we're passing down that knowledge to our children um yeah that's am i missing anything what would you... <clears throat> um no just you know, the entire, the importance of basketry to our people. When you look today, it's plastic bags or paper bags or suitcases or shopping bags. You know, we didn't have any of that kind of gear. So baskets were really a key functional, important part of how we transported goods, how we, um, you know, did our everyday life functioning because we didn't have pots and pans. We didn't have the things, um, the amenities that we have today. So baskets were what we utilized and there was no void. It all functioned um, and different types of basketry were for different functions, loose weaves for gathering and and just carting goods back um you know backpacks that uh just carried everything i saw a question pop up and somebody said oh what about dyes i wanted to just one of our textile friends, you probably can't see these very well, but one of our textile producing friends, this, this is wolf lichen. You can't hardly see it, but it's almost a lime, very lime, lemon, greenish yellow. Um, and what can be produced out of one, one source? This is alder bark cooked in urine. This is alder cones cooked with water, such a beautiful brown. This is alder bark cooked with water. It's this beautiful taupe gray. And this is alder bark, the inner bark cooked with urine. And it's a very nice brown. So Dying was a natural part. And of course, this was only in one season of the year to get some of the more vibrant colors. It would have had to been in the summertime during berry season or specifically when roots of plants are having those highlights of greens. But we not only wove baskets, we wove um, skins. We wove, uh, collected, and um, did weavings out of goat hair. We used to have uh, expeditions up into the Alpine in where the mountain goats were and grab, gather up those big fluff ball sheets of goat hair when they shed in the mountains. Marilyn, um, Connie asks, did you mix tree species when making different kinds of baskets, maybe with an addition of willow or anything else? 
yes, we did use some like willow for like the lip of a basket. It would be a little bit different. Um, I'll show you one here that's sitting here. I'm going to bring all my stash back baskets here. This here is a cedar root basket. And it's got a really nice weave. And as you can see, it has buckskin ties. My grandmother actually made this basket. And you know, she died quite a few years back. And if she would have lived a couple more months, she would have been 100 years old. This is birch bark. So you can see this has like a willow, um, a piece of willow at the top to hold this bit. And of course, these aren't watertight or anything. And then they're just stitched together. And I really like the different textures of inner and outer bark profiled in the basket. And this is the cedar bark, the inner bark. And sometimes you can weave in little natural nobules that the wood produces. Um, and again, here's another um, cedar bark and this one someone took leather and wove the top of this basket with leather. So these are sort of my catch-all baskets and of course there's um, this one's a little whopper jawed but this is a, a pine needle. That was actually my first mm -hmm. pine needle basket and that cedar basket I wrote I wove. This one with the letter. Yeah. yeah. It was one of my first baskets. And this little square one too. I didn't do that one. You didn't? No. They are so beautiful. We Mel also oh, would wear things like this, like wristbands on our arms. And it's interesting to note that um, it's a big thing to uh, know these words like uh, malheep for cedar. And when we express ourselves in the language and the language in the land, that language reflects back by what's on the land. So if you go into uh, Silk territory, which is the Okanagan, cedar doesn't grow there. They don't even have words for it. So um, those words come from other areas where that plant actually exists. So bringing these things to life and light is a good thing. There was a question about other place names that... Uh... That are happening, and we actually uh, produced a map uh, that has a bunch of place names on it. I can show um, if I. This is my. Oh, you have this one. This is my laminated copy. It's uh, it, it comes folded, but this is my laminated copy. This is what we call a, a counter mapping. So it is of the Tumbula. It is, the water represents red. And the back, of course, is all full of information. But uh, we have an occupation camp here. And um, Nikhauten is the name of our um, 
our camp, different areas. Just in the printed map, there's probably maybe 40 or 50 names on there. But this map is going to be released digitally soon. And you'll be able to link to it through our website. And um, you can go to our website and see more of this map. It's got just our, our names on it. And in the digital map, you'll be able to go there and hear the enunciation for those place names. I just popped a link um, into the chat for where you can get both of those maps, either a folded version or a laminated version. Uh, Mel Mercier asked, uh, were hemlock trees ever used for any particular purpose, if you would be happy to share? Um, hemlock's kind of like cedar, but we didn't really utilize it medicinally like we did cedar or um, for tool making or those kinds of things. I imagine for timbers, it was you know, when we did our pit houses, we, we um, have uh, subterranean dwellings. And so it has beams up over the, um, the pit house. And so hemlock would have been used for some of that. Although, you know, I'm not the herbalist, the old gals were or anything, and maybe I do remember some utilization of um, the different species of trees. But you for sure was one of our magic trees. You is what we built bows out of. Um, Hawthorn is what we, it's very hardwood. So we would produce our digging sticks with that. Um, those kinds of things. Could you share, Joe asked, are there other things you made out of birch bark other than just baskets as well? Or did it have some more use? Um, birch, we, we used a lot of birch for things like, um, even though we utilized hides as well for parfletches, but uh, you know, we didn't take big strips out of birch bark trees. And unlike today when birch are being cut down and you can go gather big strips of it, um, white pine specifically, White pine is what we made our sturgeon nose canoes out of, and um, and pitch, and um, that's a pretty fabulous um, tree that we utilized all the time, and they were quite um, the way white pine grows. It's got a just a straight up trunk, no branches, no knots, no anything to deal with. So then, and they grew huge. Now there's no uh, large white pine here. They're pretty scarce. They're like and, the unicorn of trees right now. And the, yeah. the bark almost glows um, and stands out even in the daytime. They're quite a beautiful tree. If, if you've seen them, then you know. But yeah, it's like a You'll be walking through the forest and you'll just see a glowing, basically a glowing tree. And you're like, why is that tree so different? And then you're like, oh, it's the, it's the white pine. Um, and yeah, I think there, there's one on top of Perry's Ridge, uh, one or two. And then there's one, um, they're very scarce. But anyways, yeah, I've, there's a couple in our territory that I've seen. I don't know if you can see that, but that's what our pit house dwellings sort of look like, a rendition of them. And then this is what our sturgeon nose canoe design looked like. As you can see, it has a flat, you say bow or bow, flat bow, bow. design. 
And so um, we utilized lots of different kinds of woods and, um, you know, we are a pitiful and struggling people who lost a lot of things through this declared extinction. And bringing these stories back to life and some of these practices, we at our occupation site, we do have a full-size pit house there. And, you know, we hold gatherings there and um, we're doing our winter dance ceremonies there and trying to bring some of our culture, our ways, our practices back to life after this really destructive imposed declaration of extinction. Uh, the canoe, the Sturgeon Nose Canoe, there's actually a story in the book uh, that it, uh, talks about the Sturgeon Nose Canoe. And um, they would have utilized the, the the waterways um, in our Chumhulao uh, were very extensive and basically like a super highway. You could get on the river and in a relatively short period of time could make a, make up a very big distance, um, especially the Columbia. The Columbia was a, a big, strong river. Um, so yeah, th they would have used them on any kind of water fast, uh, slow, um, and they were dug out of white pine. I think it was a dug out type canoe. Am I correct on that one? No, bark. No? The bark, it was the bark? canoe, yeah. Well, I thought they dug them out too at some point, like the ribs or something like that. Well, the ribs are strips of wood. Mm -hmm but the outer part of the canoe was all bark and sewn together like that and like a sturgeon. And, like and a, what, would you, what would you say was that woman's work or men, a man's work? I would say um, basically a man's work but all the other bits that went to make it were also part of what women provided because you did have to gather quite a bit of pitch and have pitch stores available in your canoe for patches or whatever. Um, you know, when we paddle the water, um, like Therese said, our waterways are huge. They're, you know, 50, 60 kilometers, Arrow Lakes is, you know, it, even though it's the Columbia River, that's probably a couple hundred kilometers that you would consider lake, but it's really the river. Um, Slocan Lake is probably 50 kilometers long or more. Uh, Kootenai Lake is, is super long. It's probably a hundred kilometers. So these big massive waterways needed a flat bow that could uh, traverse those um, those big lake effect lakes because they they do get very wavy and they are large bodies of water. Thank you. Um, as we come up to the hour uh, or on the hour, um, what we might do is do this sort of soft close and get a bit of the paperwork out of the way. And then we could continue on for just a few minutes after that. Um, if there's just endless questions about trees coming in, it's so fascinating. I just want to say a huge limb limped Marilyn and Therese for your uh, incredible knowledge and for sharing your stories with us in this moment.
So uh, before we say goodbye, um, there is one last workshop in this series. Uh, it's on March 10th uh, and it's water education resources. And we have water rangers project wet and ocean wise um, sharing resources for educators and learners. Um, a link to that chat will be here. Uh, we've got uh, the book um, of stories and I might share um, the online virtual exhibit if you're okay with that, Marin and, and Therese, oh, um, in a moment. I'll, I'll share it because it's so visually stunning. If you haven't seen the book, it, part of what it, it makes it so special is the art and the way that it connects. And I have listened to all of the stories and you look at this and you listen and it's phenomenal. And they made an amazing virtual exhibit. So I'll put a link to that in a moment. Um, we'd love to give away two $25 gift cards uh, to the outdoor learning store. And I... Um, that will enable you uh, potentially to buy the book. Um, we are going to send a follow up email with um, a recording with um, links to getting a certificate of participation. If you don't get it by lunchtime tomorrow, please check your spam. It might be hiding in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask you to get your typing fingers ready. And I am going to ask for, in order to win one of our Outdoor Learning Store prizes, if anyone can remember the name, the Snipes name of any of the trees that were mentioned. First two people in there. Uh, I'm looking for the Snipes. Oh, Samantha Mulheap. And Muldeep Joe, I think. I think I'm going to go with Samantha and Joe Malheep and Maldeep. Um, congratulations. Uh, thanks for listening. And I will uh, take your email uh, from our registration list and I'll send you an online uh, gift certificate to the store. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thanks, Jade. Um, I just like to hop in and say thank you so much, Marilyn and Therese for this wonderful presentation and um, sharing your stories. I just feel really lucky that I get to have the opportunity to learn from you um, and hear the, the rich um, traditions and knowledge. Uh, it's very good. I have two prizes from Taking Outside as well to give away. Um, we just introduced new tools at our store so I'll pop the link to the toques in the chat if you want to go shop them. But I randomly picked two winners from the participants list today. Um, and the winners are... Do, 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 do. Let me get my notes open. Okay, Kimberly Olsen and Yukino Hata. Congrats, Kimberly and Yukino. If you can just um, direct message me your email, I will be in touch and we'll get you your toques. Thanks so much, Fahim. Um, yes, that's it from us talking. Yeah, if you have just five or 10 minutes to stick around, um, we can do uh, a little bit more chatting. Uh, the questions are just rolling in, Marilyn. Um, and, uh, Yes, thank you so much for joining us and for taking this time um, to deepen your knowledge and we, um, what knowledge we have received. What kind of questions are there? One of the questions, Malin's asking, can you replant white pine or prune away infected branches if it's been afflicted with an infection because it's such a special tree? <clears throat> There is this rust that has been sort of growing on a lot of trees. I, my personal opinion is, is a lot of trees are suffering now from things like rust and, and other issues because of climate change. Um, once a tree is diseased, it's really diseased. There's really no especially white pine, there's no really bringing it back to um, a healthy, it'll live, but it just doesn't represent what that tree is. 
right now what we're looking for and what we're going to be doing this year is we're taking a lot of our plants to a, a place down the road and they're going to help us propagate plants that people use medicinally or for textiles that if they have the wherewithal to plant them in their yards, that it's a way for people to um, begin developing a personal relationship with these, these plants, trees on their own property where they can sit with them. I mean, um, I myself personally, I, I had a bout with cancer and um, I went every, t the, the chemo that I was doing was a derivative of the U-tree. And every time before I went to chemo, I would go to that tree and ask for its help. And having these relationships and something that is physical to go and ask for help. People don't know where their medicine comes from. They don't know what is part of the healing process is engaging and creating relationship with these very things that are in the pharmacopoeia that we take. So, you know, having these relationships and creating them in your own yard as much as best as you can is a beginning first step to having a better relationship with all of these things we use and maybe figuring out a better way to help them remain sustainable. So the white pine that we're going for is, there's probably only two old growth white pine that we keep pretty secret. <laughs> And we're going to try and get some cuttings to propagate the, that white pine. Good luck. That's excellent. Uh, Carmen has raised her hand. You're muted, Carmen. Well, sorry, I was late today, um, but I always enjoyed those uh, meetings. Um, I. Um, I'm uh, working on a, an art project with the uh, Riverstoke people, a school, and we're talking about the Columbia River. And I'm wondering if the white pines would be the pines that would be would have been old growth pines that were, uh, you know, with the, the the damming and all that that were went under the water and basically died. Um, actually, I'm, I imagine there were some in there, Yeah. but mostly what was flooded and that did cause or potentially cause a problem in discussing going under, doing underwater logging is because many of those trees were cedar. Okay. That once you go underground and you log those trees, you're going to um, be releasing a lot of um, toxins into the water from the logging process and from the disturbing the trees now that they're there and undisturbed, it's not that big of a deal. But if we went in and harvested them and broke down a lot of those pieces, it would be coming, uh, become an issue. Okay, thank you. But in this book there is the story of the Columbia River that's a coyote story and uh, in the Not Extinct book. And um, for one of our landmarks, I really believe, and especially at Revelstoke, um, that that would be an important story for you to, to know of us. Is the book available uh, anywhere in Revelstoke? Um, you could ask that at um, sonyx.org and I'm not sure. I know it's in Nakas. I, I think the library has a couple of copies in Revelstoke. I okay. Think. Okay. I will uh, 
Or we, we can ship you one within the week from the outdoor learning store. Yeah. And it's written by whom? It's by Marilyn and Therese. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I'll be in touch with you if I can. Thank you. Uh, Connie asks, um, or she expresses, she's still flawed that the government has declared you extinct. Uh, do other nations acknowledge your nation? Do other nations? Mm -hmm. um, largely traditional people do recognize us. Through the treaty process, it has caused a lot of controversy. And the government is treating other tribal groups in our territory. So it's causing quite a divisive argument between um, those natives who are colluding in our genocide. And, but traditionally we're very well acknowledged and accepted. Um, the Okanagan say we don't even exist. We're part of them. Tanaha say we're part of them. Um, if we're part of them, then why aren't they extinct too? It's just us. So um, we were the only Indian people on the Columbia River system in Canada. And when you understand the economic mass that the river system represents billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars, the damming, the electricity, the irrigation, you know, what happened on the Columbia River, 500 or so dams, um, being the only Indian people on the Columbia River system in Canada, and being declared right before extinct, right before the signing of the Columbia River Treaty between the US and Canada gives you uh, all the information you need to know why we're in this situation. The government of Canada wasn't nice and still isn't nice. And we've been asking them to correct this issue for a long time. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Patricia Meldrum's got her hand up. She'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Hi, Marilyn. Hi. What a lovely uh, workshop we've got going here. Um, yeah. I'm I'm living in Cranbrook, BC, and I'm I'm thinking you're talking about um, white bark pine. White pine. Or is it just white pine? So it's totally different from white bark pine? Uh, yeah, it's, it, the tree's actually called white pine. Okay, so we probably don't have any in Cranbrook then. Uh, in our area. Maybe not. Mm, okay. Do you know what you make, which trees you make out of, you make glue with? glue we didn't we used for glue we use pitch oh yeah okay so and from any tree really uh yeah some sticks better than others and some oh. is water people than others oh sorry i got sorry about that <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And um, to respect your everyone's time, especially yours, Marilyn and Therese, uh, we'll take one last question from Aviva, and then we'll uh, we'll do a close there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jade, and thank you, Marilyn and Therese. Um, I saw your land declaration declaration that you guys posted the other week and I um, was really happy um, to see you sharing that. And one thing that I was wondering, you know, in engaging with the governments, have you guys also been in contact with some of the local funding organizations? Because 
when they have their indigenous um, engagement components in a lot of the grant applications, the SNIACs aren't recognized, but then the other nations are. So I was just wondering if you have been in contact with any of them and if any progress is being made there to have you recognized. Um, it's very, we walk a very fine line and it depends upon the funding organization itself, whether some of our grants are accepted or not. Some grants require you to be federally recognized. Other grants are willing to look more at the traditional, uh, funding traditional projects and those kinds of things. We have been receiving the FPCC grants for re language revitalization and, um, and like the mapping project. Um, it's just, we're just at the beginning stages of that. But a lot of other, the big funding organizations really, we're, we don't qualify. And that makes a lot of our work, you know, where tribal groups, federally recognized tribal groups, they get millions of dollars from the government to function every year. Um, and, you know, I get that they're a big organization, but I'd like to see more deliverables to the people. I'd like to see more of the the stuff being shared we do you know we have a very generous community and people donate their time their work their gifts and it's we produce some incredible deliverables and you know we're really grateful for those funding organizations that are just a little more lenient in their um, criteria for applying. It's not optimal because a lot of these projects aren't begin here and end here projects, like bringing back the language, that's going to take us year, decades to do. And when you're funding year by year by year, and it's not a rollover grant, it's almost that start stop that destroys a lot of the momentum, especially in trying to preserve a language where we probably have possibly three speakers left. And trying to resurrect that language is going to require some real long term work. And, and some of the other work that we're doing as well. But is long term, but that's one that you know I really I'm really committed to and really would like to see that become part of it. And of course, a lot of people involved in in native language groups now are trying to flatten the language instead of trying to resurrect dialects or keep dialects viable. They're just saying, oh no, for you know, this part of the Salish world, we're gonna use say Okanagan because they've had a school for a long time. Well, it's one dialect of this Northern Salish patch. Does that mean our dialects are, aren't as important? And I really believe dialects tie us to the land and are very definitive of our landscape. So um, yeah. That's, that's the downside to grants, even though some pretty wonderful things are being produced. And I encourage you, so many projects are rolling out right now. We're just all excited about, um, and our website just got up. So keep going there over the next couple of months. Um, there's also a documentary film that we're hoping to, um, put out by May and it covers from 1994 basically to current and uh, really looking forward to that documentary. And the uh, Not Extinct will be out on 
the uh, audio book soon as oh, well. Yeah. Our That's virtual great. living book. So yeah. that'll be coming easier to get. And I, I popped the link to your virtual exhibit, which gives you a bit of a taste of the art and the stories, but you need the book to get the full experience. Um, Mel is really desperate to ask one really quick question, if you don't mind, and then we really will close. Okay. Go ahead, Mel. Hi there. Thank you so much for this wonderful workshop. Um, I just, uh, this is maybe off topic, but like, I feel like you would be a good connection to um, help figuring this out. I had this idea and maybe other people have, and I'm not sure, but um, I was wondering if uh, there, it, basically my question is about the Heritage Conservation Act and my understanding of a portion of this act is to um, help protect uh, heritage sites. And some of these heritage sites um, have included some areas where there's been a culturally modified trees and um, other areas uh, that needed to be um, protected. And I was wondering about that, like, if if there was a way with all the um, First Nations groups to talk to the government about adjusting some of the definitions of this Heritage Conservation Act to include the remainder of the old growth trees you know even though they haven't been touched in a way like that can show people nowadays that the tree has been culturally modified or whatnot but they have been such a, a precious piece in the culture in history and so how can we include these trees as part of like to be protected Anyway, that's an idea I had, and uh, maybe it's not possible, but maybe it's the way to go to save the old growth that we have left. Well, we are we are engaging in some discussions with um, Seer, uh, who are um, laying the groundwork for um, species at risk and how we protect habitat for species at risk. Caribou is a species at risk. Trying to get the species at risk people um, to talk to the Ministry of Forest people who can also talk to then conservation who might talk to heritage <laughs> or not. It's a you know, it's just one of those, those issues that we've been sort of red flagging for a long time. And um, I think it's going to take a public outcry of people across every aspect of life, no matter where they live, urban, not urban, in the bush, not in the bush, to say, leave old growth alone. It's too valuable for our climate. It's too val valuable for our biodiversity. It is endangered. Leave it alone. And, you know, Ministry of Forest is playing this well, if it's this kind of tree and it's this big in diameter, it's probably not old growth. But um, we were just put a protest up on Enterprise Creek. They were cutting down 250 year old spruce. They, weren't, they were big, but they weren't that big. But spruce grows very slow. The rings are just so tight. So, 
Ministry of Forest is supporting the logging industry. Ministry of Forest is not supporting the forest. And I keep telling these corporations and companies and ministries, don't manage bears, don't manage caribou, don't manage trees, manage, manage people. You know, if we no longer had those trees, we'd have to look at and utilize other kinds of building materials. It's not that they're not out there. It's just that these large corporations taking these resources really don't give a shit, except for their bottom dollar. And so I think it really is going to take a massive outcry for that impact to be heard. And I think the government's in a position now where it, it it's poised to listen. Thank you for that. This is a very strong message to finish on and one I'm sure many of us can take away and be try and be those voices. So thank you all. And I say to all of you, limb, limp, limb, limp, 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 limp. Lim limp to you, Marilyn. Lim limp to you, Therese. Thank you so much for sharing your incredible knowledge with us this evening. Good night to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And um, we hope we see you again at one of our other workshops. Lim limp. Lim limp. Lim limp.